Now welcome to another edition of News from Naboo with the Worst Lightning Takes. And let's get right to the news. All right, we heard from Tony Gilroy. Not us personally, I'm sorry. He's not returning my call. <laughs> He's not for some reason. <laughs> Go figure. But he did an interview with Hollywood Reporter. It's part of the Emmys campaign because obviously Andor is in line for a few obviously. Emmys. Deserves it, yeah. Yeah. He shared some of his thinking process going into such a massive IP the roundtable did happen like a month and a half ago before the strike was announced and Gilroy had stopped working on Andor Season 2, but he talked about Season 1, so meh. When like asked about the creative choice that scared the crews the most, Gilroy brought up the fact that in like every new draft, the writers kept adding more and more characters. And, I mean, interviews last year for Season 1 said he had 195 speaking parts. That's insane. It is insane, but it makes the universe feel real. I agree with that, yeah. If people aren't just in the background making gestures and you're presuming conversations, but if people actually are speaking, it means they're not, you know, if they're more than just that guy over there, because they all have roles, they all have stories and history and a part to play. Yeah, that's what I liked about Ferrix, too. More so than a lot of other Star Wars locations, it felt like a, like you could understand the, the role people were playing in the society. You could see this person had this job and that job. It was yes. very intricate. It felt like you were actually taking a... Like a real a, place. Yeah, it was very cool. What's funny is we watched an interview that he did with Variety, so I guess we're going to mesh these two together. He has never been to the Ferrex set. What? Yeah. This interview, he said he had never been to Ferrex. He did all the directing, all the work for that. He did from at home. That is <laughs> truly impressive. Despite Most impressive. all the things that were shot there, he'd never been to Ferrex. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot that happens on Ferrex. Like, a good chunk of the show happens on Ferrex. It's kind of the central hub in a lot of ways it really is it's the kickoff to the big rebellion scene at the end i mean it's yeah it's a it's very important base. location yeah it's it's everything to the series so mm -hmm. we're never there right i mean it, it bookended the whole series ferrix yeah and he never got to visit the set i mean we've seen behind the scenes video of ferrix and ferrix was like built yeah, it is, is a location it is not a full-on green yeah. screen it is you can walk around the square. You can walk down Rick's Road. Brick somebody. <laughs> well, maybe don't do that. No, but... unless it's an Imperial, then it's okay. Oh, uh, you're hopeless. What? I'm all rebel. <laughs> yeah. He kind of then added how he felt the pressure making the show, but not exactly because of the fan base, but because of the enormity of the project he ended up creating. Andor's budget is apparently rumored to be $250 million. That... Is also ridiculous. It's like that's major motion an episode? picture. Yeah, that's more than like Game of Thrones. I think Game of Thrones was only averaging like ten in its final season. <laughs> Could be mistaken about that, but that's that's a ridiculous amount of money. It is, but it seemed worth it. I mean, well, it looks amazing. Some people loved it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wonder how Disney feels about the returns on that two hundred fifty million mm -hmm. number of views it got. But from my perspective, yeah, worth every penny. Gilmore said. The multiples of expense and the amount of people working means the pressure is enormous, but it was going to represent a really large part of my life, so I wasn't going to change my game. Everybody kind of knows what I do and what I want to do, and that I like a great deal of independence, but I like to deliver for people. There was a pretty healthy understanding that if we were going to go the way I said we wanted to go, we were going to be pretty disruptive about what we were doing. I didn't have to worry about that. It's, it's nice because he's talking about how he was afforded a certain amount of creativity yeah. in what he was doing. He had this freedom to kind of stretch out a little bit. And he made these subplots for characters that, looking back at the character of Mon Mothma, for example, we see her originally, of course, in Return of the Jedi. And she's just some rebel leader. Yeah, she's, she's kind of nobody when she shows up. We haven't heard of her before. Mm -hmm. She just gives a little speech right. before the Battle of Endor and that's it. Yeah, then we see her again in the prequels. Uh, she, sort in the of. deleted scenes. In the yeah, deleted we don't scene, we know really she's see her in the prequels kind so of a part of something. Yeah, she's the delegation of 2000. Yeah. She she's shows kind of up the in Rebels. Early, early Rebel. Makes, about, yeah. you know, a little speech that she's defecting and down with the Empire. In Andor, she's, you can tell she's a higher up in the Rebellion, but she doesn't have a personality yet. She doesn't have a character until Andor. He invented that for her. And now looking back on those scenes, well, knowing what she's probably sacrificed. She's in the EU too, but yeah. But I, that, I know what you're saying. You, doesn't yes. count. you know that. 
<laughs> oh, them's fighting words, but okay. We talk in canon. Uh, I know, I know. We generally keep it to the Disney canon. Tony Gilroy took a character that was just kind of a background figurehead and made them a person. No, oh, yeah, I agree entirely. I mean, within the within the films and anybody who's just watching the films and the shows, like that's really your introduction to the real Mon Mon. You know, he yeah. really made a, a character out of her instead of oh, she's the rebellion leader, of course, and that's about all you could really say about her and they made the he made the empire into something frightening something truly to be feared with the understanding of what the isb really does watching the inner workings how a single tie fighter could have jeopardized an entire mission that was absolutely the most impressive thing he did is making the empire truly terrifying like when you see a stormtrooper it means something like like i said when you see a tie fighter like one tie fighter is like oh my goodness Mm -hmm. that's a threat because we got kind of used to, especially like a show like Rebels, which I love, but it does have that problem of like... Empire's a joke. Empire's a joke. And we you, need to see the Empire as the machine of horror that they are. Absolutely. Because or else, why are, we, why are we fighting them? They're a joke. Anyone can take them out. Yeah, like they kill themselves. They can't hit the broad side of the barn. You know, they're, mm-hmm. yeah, they're terrible. <laughs> they can't do their job. Well, we which, need to know why the people fear them. And yes. Andor did a wonderful job of showing us how the everyday man sees the Empire. Yeah, and why they're terrifying. Mm-hmm. I really feel like this creative freedom he got, really, like, it shows his skills as a writer, honestly. Well, what's impressive is, because I always say, like, I, I'm not a fan of, like, people who don't know Star Wars kind of coming in and messing with the world, but mm-hmm. he, he didn't know Star Wars, but he came in with, like, he even says here, like, he wants to please the fans. Like, it's not like he's just making his own thing, like other writers, directors maybe have. But he's coming in with the intent to try to make something that, yeah, fans will like, but he's still... He's still bringing his own flair and his own style and his own story to it, which it, it merged beautifully. Like, could have gone terribly, but instead it's arguably the best Star Wars we've gotten in a long time. He was also asked about his relationship with the Star Wars fan base, which can be particularly challenging, yep. especially for filmmakers of late. He said, We just went and did the Star Wars celebration in London two weeks ago, and it's really a pleasure to say to them with all honesty that they're investors in our show. It's their mad passion that forms the basic motor that gave Disney the economic guts to gamble on something as brazenly different as what we did. So I pay attention to it. I know a great deal about a five-year period in Star Wars canonical history, and I won't embarrass myself and describe how little I know about the rest of it. It would be criminal if I didn't have great affection for the environment that I'm playing in for five years. It would be a crime against nature to take five years of your creative life and not really believe in the thing you're doing. Yeah, that's well said. Like, mm-hmm. why? If you're going to do it, do it. Learn the ins and outs. Yeah. Give it your all. I mean, he said before, he, he kind of will look at this when it's all said and done as like one of his greatest achievements. Because he is putting five years of his life into it. So Yeah, the may- show may not be going on for the five seasons, but yeah. that doesn't mean he isn't giving it at all. He definitely is. Yeah, and I like that he respects that. He understands, like, the fans, in a way, are affording him this opportunity, too. I think a lot of times they kind of forget that like Mm -hmm. the reason why star wars why they can spend 250 million dollars on star wars is because you have a fan base who allows you to do that it's a you know it's almost a symbiotic circle you might say oh yeah there you go i mean the narrative of the series is about to enter a critical point moving into season two because there is an issue with canon that he's running up against and i think he's blowing off there is a comic book issue it's Hmm. a one issue comic from 2017 that told the story of the first encounter of cassian and k2 and I don't believe he's following that. He's doing his own thing. I guess I can overlook that. I mean, Dave kind of does his own thing when he wants, so... Yeah, it's... If it's good enough, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine with that. It's unfortunate, I'll say that. Not because the comic book was groundbreakingly good, and I remember it, you know, cover to cover, but because it, it is unfortunate that we have to keep... Retconning. Undoing, retconning these yeah. stories that, you know, we pay good money to read, and a lot of times they are enjoyable. The Kanan comics, the Ahsoka novel both good stories i think in this case because it just kind of ends up in the middle of what he's creating and he has created something fantastic i think most people myself included are gonna let it slide i'm gonna let it slide he does such a wonderful job it's yeah i mean i don't want to think he wouldn't make that fantastic yeah exactly i mean i I, part of me wishes he could incorporate the comic but maybe he will we don't know until we have the finished product to be honest yeah but i you know, it's one of those things where it's a one-shot comic book that probably didn't need to be made in the first place. Yeah, so why argue. not have a phenomenal on-screen presentation? Yeah. Which is probably what Dave said when he did Tales of the Jedi. 
He probably said that about every time he retcons it. It's going to be better in live action or in my show trust or in me. my yeah. Trust me. Which okay. All right. We'll let we'll let you have it, Dave. But it, it it just delegitimizes the comics and it makes you if you're someone who keeps up with everything, it really it's frustrating because it mm-hmm. makes you wonder why do I keep up with everything? Timelines book. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's all right. In the Variety interview, he also mentioned that originally CCH Pounder was cast as Marva. I could see her as Marva. Yeah. Yeah. The reason we ended up with Fiona Shaw, though, is because when COVID started, she kind of backed out, and Fiona's name was on the list, so they called her up and were like, hey, do an and you want you want in on this? And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, they talked in detail about how he kind of fought for Marva's last line of the eulogy. It was not supposed to be fight the Empire, but F yeah, the Empire. I've heard that. Yes. I'm glad they didn't keep that. I'm glad that got rejected. You are? Well, because the the F word doesn't mean anything in Star Wars. It's never uttered anywhere else. They do some things in Star Wars. They sometimes mix in our jargon, and I'm okay with it on occasion. Well, sure. But in this case, it's, you know... You can say it's translated for our ears at home. Well, I just... In a sense. My my point is, like, it doesn't mean any... Like, for her to say that in Star Wars, nobody uses that. I mean, as far as we know. As far as we've ever seen. Uh, Didn't Mosk say something that was kind of in our universe? Yeah, Lieutenant Mosca, he drops a little S word on you. I don't like that either. I know. But, I mean, think about it. even Dang in the... Eric, I don't like it. Okay, but think on this. What did, what did Hans say at one time? I'll see you in hell! Does hell mean anything in the Star Wars universe to them? We don't know. Probably not. Right. Well, I mean, it might. It might. Some religions might have a, a quote-unquote hell. I'm saying even in the original trilogy, we had a sure. little slip. Hey, Captain Panaka said sitting ducks, and he said some other stuff, so. Yes. Even in the Rebels show, one of the clones. Godspeed Rebels was said by our... Holo, yes, but in Holo. Rebels, there was one, too. I actually think it was somewhere in Clone Wars. One of the clones said, said something that was out of universe. It was akin to what Holo said, I think. I'm not going to go watch all the Clone Wars to look for it. <laughs> Why not? I'll watch it with you. But I'm just saying, it does slip in now and again. I mean, calling something a toilet. They also did that in Andor. Oh, uh, did they? Oh. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they called it a toilet instead of a refresher. Yeah. But I did, I made the debate that perhaps the refresher is the room and the toilet is still the toilet. <laughs> Maybe, you know, Different cultures heard, you know? could have a different name for it as well. Yeah. I mean, I might say there's the bathroom, but you might be going, hey, I, I have to use the toilet. Yeah. I think the problem is the F word is so... Like, I know. I don't want to say significant... In our culture, but it is it is the kind of the upper echelon or the pinnacle of profanity. Though there mm-hmm. probably is one word that many would consider worse. Though maybe not in Australia. Oh. <laughs> but there is. It's kind of you know it is the swear word for a lot of people. So it being uttered mm-hmm. in Star Wars where it's never been uttered before just feels kind of strange. That's my take. You can disagree. That's fine. Well, I I just like to look at it when they say something like that, and you feel it might take you out of universe. I look at it as this, that we're watching a story from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. What's to say none of them were ever speaking English? And it's almost like it was a subtitled or dubbed movie for us because well, sure. we're watching yeah, I mean, almost be. a wouldn't. historical record where they're not speaking English yeah, at all. Basic would be English. So I mean, they could just have words that they didn't know how to translate and put them into our language. Yeah, basic would be its own language. Mm-hmm. It just happens to be the core language that gets translated to English, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yes. And it's I mean, like we're watching a foreign film. And you, you could make the opposite of the argument that the F word is so, again, profound in our language that it would have the impact on us that it's attempting to have, if that makes yes. sense, too. You know, you're, you're gonna going to use a word with... that we are, you know, we here on Earth or the U.S. or wherever you are, mm-hmm. again, outside of Australia, where they're a little more yeah, liberal with certain words. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to have the impact because we're going to understand the meaning behind that word, even if in Star Wars they don't. So you can go either way on it, I guess. Yeah. I like that we're getting really deep into this one... What is? It's interesting. I mean, it's actually this is the kind of thing Star Wars fans care about. It might, you know, if you're an outsider, you're like, why are you even? Why is that even a debate? Well, it's because it, it you know, everything means because something. Because it's in from universe. a different we universe, care. so you go, well, why are our words in their universe? And I yeah. look at it as a foreign film in a way because we're watching more or less a historical record of a universe that's a long time ago in a galaxy far yeah. away, and maybe they just didn't have the words to translate, so they put them into our text so we would know what they were talking about. Fair enough. Either way, I'm glad it. Is as it is. I'm okay with, with it, it as it is. I know that Disney didn't want to have to up the ra- the rating level anymore by dropping the f bomb. Yeah, 
All right, well, I guess that's going to be all we got for you this time. So now it's your turn to take to the comments below and weigh in on the F-bomb debate. I, I guess. Would you have preferred the F-bomb, or are you okay with the fight? fight. Or would you rather have an inter-universe, you know, dang Farrakh fight the Empire or something stupid like no, that? No, that would have sounded cheesy. Yeah, it would have sounded I'm cheesy. glad he didn't. <laughs> dang Farrakh the Empire. <laughs> what? Well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it just doesn't roll off the uh, tongue. It doesn't. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> take to the comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.